Lord, we do thank you for this day, and we want to ask you to be with uh, Chair Lady Lynn Smith's husband this morning. Um, take care of him. You're the great physician, and, and you, you do that, and we're just asking you to watch over them. We ask for you to watch over all the people that are trying to get to this meeting. Thank you for the ones that are here. Uh, safe travels to everyone. Be with our families while we up here, while we're here deliberating, what, trying to do what's best for the state of Georgia. But we need your guidance in that too, Lord. So we ask that you take care of us, be with us, forgive us for our sins, Lord, and thank you for letting us come together. In Je Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, this morning, glad to have everybody. I know some will keep coming in because of the weather, but. Glad to have everybody in the audience, too. and So we're going to jump right in. We're going to start out this morning. Uh, Commissioner Mark Williams is going to lead us off with the Department of Natural Resources. Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. What a, what a beautiful morning. Uh, sort of have a, have a saying in DNR, it doesn't rain on DNR, it rains in DNR. How about that? Um, but it's great to be back for front of this committee. Uh, as a former member, uh, y'all do great work. and. I really want to start off by thanking this committee for the great work they did last year in helping us with the uh, revisions to the Out Georgia Outdoor Stewardship Act and the uh, Shore Protection Act. Especially the Shore Protection Act has really made a difference down at the coast, and uh, we appreciate that great work. Speaking of the Georgia Outdoor Stewardship Act, um, as you know, it was approved by 83% of Georgians, and we just got through our first round of projects in this inaugural year, and uh, that list of projects has gone through the uh, first two steps, which is the Board of Trustees uh, voting on them, then my DNR board voting on them, and we will be presenting them to the our subcommittee on appropriation, Chairman Watson's committee, at some day next week, he informs me. So we're excited about that, but we, we were able to fund 14 projects at a total of $19.8 million, and uh, it's going to make it's it's going to make a difference in Georgia. They're they're spread out geographically, and I think everybody will be excited when they see those projects. Um, we were tasked this year, as you know, with finding some efficiencies, and uh, we're continuing to improve our services and access for sportsmen through our HB 208. We passed several years ago. We've constructed and improved hundreds of miles of roads on WMAs, open night fishing at all our PF, our public fishing areas, installed countless reef enhancements, done uh, gun range, um, shooting range uh, improvements, added thousands of acres of dove field and waterfowl habitat, and hired 30 additional new game wardens. So, we sort of had a report card when we asked y'all to give us that license increase, and, and I feel like, and, and our customers feel like we also, that we're living up to that task, and I'm very proud of my folks for that. That's a couple of highlights. We got a, a lot of presenters today, so I was, I've asked each of my division directors to come up and uh, give a little rundown on their part of DNR since we last met, and uh, I think you're going to hear some Real good news from our State Parks and Historic Resources Director, Jeff Count. So I'll turn it over to him. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I'm glad to be here today to talk about the oldest state park system and the best state park system in the United States, in my, my humble opinion. Uh, first off, we, we say we're the oldest because of Indian Springs State Park that was founded in 1931 down here in Flovilla, Georgia. Uh, and that park, and the reason I say it's the oldest in the nation is that spring has been in continuous ownership of Georgia since uh, 1826, so a long time. So uh, always like, it's a beautiful place. I was there this week, and it's always wonderful to be there. Just talk a little bit about uh, our social media, which is the new thing today. We use this a lot in our marketing. We now have over three. Mr. Chairman. Since last year, they, we, we had it over there, but you, I was going to tell your members, there's some graphics behind you. Yeah, that's, that's a little interesting for us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. I did think something was missing there. But we do have over uh, 300,000 Facebook followers now on our state park system 62,000 instagram followers and 12 over 12,000 twitter followers um there our mark my marketing team is constantly trying to teach me how to do this stuff uh i've not learned how to hashtag yet but i'm working on it i 
So to see my pictures that I take every now and then, but this is a big part of our marketing campaign, letting folks know about our parks, letting folks know about special events, uh, cabin discounts, and we have our headquarters does uh, social media, our individual parks and their friends chapters all work on social media for our park system. Uh, it, Georgia State Parks are thriving. We are now uh, have over 11 million visitors a year as of last year, and uh, that that is equal to one billion dollars in economic impact to the state and over 10,000 jobs. Uh, so we are helping to the economy of Georgia. Um, we got a lot of new improvements at the state parks, uh, thanks to y'all on helping us with these things. We have, uh, there's a new group shelter at uh, Gordonia Latamaha State Park in uh, Reedsville. Fort Yargo's got a brand new visitor center in Winder. We are rent currently renovating cabins at Red Top Mountain. Um, we have a new group shelter at George L. Smith. I actually was at a meeting in it yesterday and it's beautiful in Twin City, Georgia. And we have a, just opened up a new visitor center at Red Top Mountain and that's on the location of the lodge that had burned many years ago. Thank you all for the help in getting these projects off the ground within state parks. And finally, uh, Josh left a one pager there that has sort of a snapshot of the many amenities we have at state parks, the cabins, campgrounds, visitor centers, and a map on the back showing you where our state parks are. So I would love to see y'all at the park. Uh, bless you. Um, and I'll be glad to meet you anytime. Um, I have a sort of a thing I, these days I talk about uh, for state parks to continue to grow. We have great people, great facilities, and good weather. So if y'all help us pray for some good weather this weekend, we can get some folks back in our state parks. Thank y'all. Any questions? Mr. Thank Chairman, you. I think because I'm going to have them each come up. If you if you want to, then take if they have parks questions while Jeff's sitting here, it might be. That'd, that'd be a great idea to take it in segments. So, yeah, we do have one. Uh, 28. Okay, Representative. All right. I just, first, I want to say uh, Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year. All right. Uh, you know, I'm a, I always have to put my credentials on the table. I started off, my first job was at Department of Natural Resources. So, I feel this committee is a great fit for me. All right. But what I want to know is you said something about uh, with your social media that you sometimes have discounts is it a particular time of the year that you have discounts or is it just you know how do you set it up we do have times of the year that we discount like uh december and uh, january we normally discount camping because there's not as many folks camping at time, that time of year mm -hmm. the good news is we even with that discount uh, we're up on camping camping is doing great this uh, this year and we continue want to continue that but sometimes it's a cabin that might be not filled on a Thursday evening and we'll, we'll push out social media that, hey, come see us at Magnolia Springs or Red Top, wherever that availability is. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, um, good morning, and I am a big fan of state parks, so I think they're a great way to get a recreational experience in Georgia. And so just out of curiosity, do you know from the numbers of visitors how many come out of state? Can you track that? I don't, we don't know exactly, but there is a good number that come out of state, and we do market on the Florida line, the North Carolina, South Carolina line, and Alabama line. We can try to pull folks as they're coming through our state into our state parks. And down like I-95, you know, uh, Chairman Murray has helped us with DOT signs to get folks pulled off the interstate into our parks. And, and the commissioner reminded me also we have discounts for senior citizens and disabled military in our state parks as well. Uh, a little follow-up on that answer. If there's a hurricane, we get a lot out of state. <laughs> uh, proud, I'm proud of our park system when they step up for hurricanes. We've had as many as uh, 12,000 people in our parks during, oh, wow. during a hurricane. Yeah, I, I hope we don't get another uh, we hurricane. Don't, I think, well, I that's think we're that's good not a good year. business model to no. have. So. <laughs> okay. Thank uh, Re Representative Hogan. You, you just answered my question about senior discounts. I appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> Anything going on down at Hoffle Broadfield? Uh, we have a lot of programming that continues to go on at Hoffle, we, and that's it's a historic site, and that's how we bring folks in. It's a day-use park and with history, uh, and they continually have programming. To find out a lot what's going on is to join that uh, Facebook page or you know like that Facebook page, and you'll see that. Now, far as things we're working on, we keep the, the house up to try to keep it maintained in the buildings. We also have to do a lot of tree work there. There's a lot of live oak, so we do some tree work there as well. 
to maintain if, the property. If, if none of you have ever attended uh, Hoffle uh, Broadfield, I would highly recommend it. It's a historical area uh, and uh, just great. Yes, so thank is. you. Thank you. And thanks for FDR Park. Yes, sir. I live about a few miles from it, and it is tremendous for our area down there. It's just kind of a hidden gem to a lot of folks until they come that first time, but it's just great. All right. Um, thank you, Jeff. We really thank appreciate you. that. Mm -hmm. Commissioner? Next, Mr. Chairman, I'll have Colonel Thomas Bernard to come up and give an LE briefing. Very good. Thank you, Good Colonel. morning. Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you for being with us. Yes, sir. The committee. I think I should have chosen a patrol boat this morning for uh, coming <laughs> into Atlanta. And I think we've got a new river outside our doors here. I just want to talk about the great work that our game wardens do uh, each and every day across this state, uh, from the mountains to the coast. We have 207 uh, game wardens. Uh, they got full arrest powers of a peace officer. And uh, just looking at the numbers, uh, we patrol over 16,000 miles of rivers across the state, uh, 500,000 acres of impounded waters, that's like Lake Lanier, uh, 100 linear miles of coastal shoreline, and we've got 200 miles offshore. Uh, we have uh, patrolled over 37 million acres of public and private lands across the state, and that also includes 60 of our state park properties and 131 wildlife management areas along with 10 public fishing areas. So we've got a lot, of, a lot of land to cover. This past year, we uh, conducted over 368 search and rescue missions, and that's for folks that are lost in the woods, uh, whether it's private property or it's our WMAs and also uh, missing boaters on the water. And we investigated over 141 boating incidents, uh, and we responded and recovered 56 drownings across the state as well. We talk about community involvement and how important that is for our folks to be known throughout their community. You think about the counties in your districts, those folks in those counties, a lot of them know who their game warden is, and we really, really push that. It's very, very important uh, for that. And so I, can't, I think this number reflects that. In this past year, they taught uh, 1,583 educational programs across the state. And a lot of that's targeted to our school-aged children about conservation and conservation law enforcement. And so if you break down the numbers uh, across the state with our population, our game warden, each game warden serves about 50,000 residents. Well, our training academy is underway, and I'm, I'm glad I'm not down there because they're woken up at 4.30 every morning and they're having to run and do all that fun stuff. But uh, they're down there for 23 weeks. And uh, we started off with 10, we have nine remaining at this point, and probably will keep the nine, usually about the first week or two. Some folks will figure out it's just not for them and, and uh, we'll move on. But uh, they'll be graduating June the 12th and we'll be pushing them out to the field at that point in time. Once they graduate, they have a three month FTO program where they ride with another game warden that grades them each day on how they interact with the public. So this is the cool stuff, as they say, what everybody likes to see, and this is kind of what you see a lot on our Facebook page. Our aviation, we have three pilots. We have four different aircraft, three helos and a fixed wing. Uh, we're the primary response agency for search and rescue in a woodland and water environment. And so our aviation unit does a lot of the long line rescues that you may see in the North Georgia mountains. Uh, we are the only repel program in the state and only one of two in the southeast where we actually uh, 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 rappel down a game warden that's medically trained to evaluate a patient. And you look at the Appalachian Mountains up there, there's a places up there you just can't get to. And oftentimes off the Appalachian Trail, uh, that's how we have to do our business in order to get them and fly them back out. So very proud of this uh, unit and what they've done. They had 340 total missions uh, this past year. Our canine program, you see one of our dogs up there in the water. Uh, we, we struggle keeping them out of the water because they like to hop in there, but uh, they do a, a, a really great job, and we deploy those a lot on our missing persons, and they find a lot of folks for us. The, their, their abilities are tracking, evidence recovery, apprehension, of course, officer protection. Uh, you see our sonar operators are, as well. Uh, they get called in after the first 24 hours when someone is missing, 
And this is a team that has all the underwater toys like the sector scan and the side scan sonar, uh, that type of equipment looking for the missing persons. Uh, we also have our critical action teams this morning coming into I-20. I sat there for an hour and then realized there was a tree across the road, which uh, jogged my memory about our, our CAT teams. And you probably see them. They merge together with WRD and Parks debris removal teams. So when you have a storm uh, here in the state, uh, they are the first to deploy. They are the tip of the spear. And oftentimes, they're the first people uh, that our citizens see uh, if you look, think back about the last hurricane we had in southwest Georgia, they were able to cut their way in and make headway and uh, get uh, relief to them. So we were challenged back in August to think about how could we streamline our operations. When you look at our officers, each person has a laptop in their vehicle. When I came on, it was a truck, a radio, and a gun, and a good luck to go with it, right? And so... Now we do a lot more training. Uh, Commissioner Williams has really pushed that with our folks. We're more professional now today than we ever have been before. With that, I was at seven regions. I had a, a $4.2 million bond request to move the Macon office. I had two retirements coming up. And that was a captain and admin sergeant in the office. Uh, the office admin support personnel, uh, I moved to headquarters, same drive time for them. So. Uh, at that point in time, my decision, this is one of those 2 o'clock in the morning deals, right, where you wake up and, it, and the light bulb goes off. We can do this and absorb uh, uh, and keep the boots on the ground uh, like they are, and they see no impact from the public. And so I went from seven regions down to six, and you can see the map there. So essentially the make an office is what was closed, and uh, it, it touched every region in the state. It was a heavy lift, especially administratively, as you can imagine. Everything's tied to that employee so we redrew the work units. Uh, so you may have gotten a new supervisor, you may have gotten a new captain, uh, but you still remain in the same area. And that's who our citizens see, so there was no effect whatsoever. And I'm able to reallocate uh, those upper level positions back to boots on the ground. Uh, that kind of addressed the span of control. It also gave me additional support along our coastline. I added uh, 20 officers along the coast by doing that as well. So. And that is all for my presentation. Any questions? I have one. Uh, of the new people coming in for the training, what would you say the average age of those? Uh, 23. 23. Yes, sir. Do, do some of those already have a college degree, or is it required to have a college degree? Yes, sir. It's, uh, we, we, we require an associate's degree at, at a minimum. <clears throat> And how about uh, any females? Yes, okay. yes. That's good. We've got a, uh, uh, last year we, we revamped our uh, recruitment committee. And so I've got a, a north and a south recruitment team uh, that makes us a very diverse team. And so uh, they're, they're really doing a great job recruiting and making us more diverse. Appreciate what y'all yes, did. And Thank you. Commissioner, with your leadership down in the southeast southwest georgia during the storm down there so appreciate that okay we got several questions uh 28 yes ma'am uh, i'm following up you know there was a obviously the nation knows there was a big crash with a helicopter so the helicopter we have do we have that safety feature that they've been talking about we do yes ma'am okay that's okay. that's called a terrain alert uh everything that we have uh that's available safety wise on our helos uh, we have that I asked the same question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Representative Court. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Colonel, thank you for the job that you're doing. A uh, couple questions, uh, if, if you may. In the magazine you got here, it shows a, uh, some, some deer that were confiscated. Thanks, you, your, your people are doing a great job. But it's mule deer, whitetail deer, and a couple antelope coming in from Wyoming, talking about CWD that's confiscated. Now, right. if those uh animals had been caped out and and the horns removed and everything all any meat brain material all that removed they would have been illegal to bring them back in that way but they've they've still i guess the, the whole skull is intact here with the brains and all in it yes so. sir that's correct so uh actually next month I've, I've got a southeastern meeting uh bringing in chiefs from all around the southeast cwd is is in tennessee and alabama or, or in mississippi as we well yeah. know and, uh, and so we're talking about that. How can we get the message out to our hunters in a better way, to our taxidermists? And that's generally who turns those folks in, is they bring right. a whole deer in and they haven't, 
they haven't done what they're supposed to do, and that's obviously to keep CWD out of the state. All right. And then the other thing on the next page, what I'd like to bring to the attention of the committee uh, on page 52, the, the palmetto berries and what an issue that's become in South Georgia. I know GFA, we're working on uh, something with Ty and Senator Harper and uh, uh, Representative James Rochette and myself are working on some legislation from private land. Uh, will, will it also, uh, do we need to enhance the law for, for uh, WMAs as, as well while we're doing that? Our, our, our Senator Harper might already be wor working with you on that already. So here's, here's how we approach that on the WMA. They have to have permission to be there to do that, yeah. so it turns into a criminal trespass, and we already have that on the books on the WMAs. Okay. So and, we're, 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 you know, we don't have anything right now on mm -hmm. the private property. And, right, and, that's and correct. that's what we're, we're working on, and didn't know if we needed to maybe enhance that to include WMAs as well. well I would like to We'd maybe like have to that it, yeah. conversation. Yeah. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Hogan. Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Could you explain to me the dove season and down in South Georgia it's so hot and the little old doves still have pin feathers and I know it's been a controversy over the years but is there any way of improving this and I mean, it, you can't you can't shoot a dove out there in uh, this hot weather we got. Right. If you could hold that question for our next presenter. Okay. He's more in charge of seasons. I, I do know that we, they're, they're, they're federal <laughs> guidelines that we have to stay within. And I'm told, but I'll, I'll let Mark talk more, more about it, but that we pretty much maximized those. We ran it further out this year in the winter. Um, and of course, because of the leap year, it didn't fall on the normal holiday weekend for opening day. And it does that, I guess, every seven years. But uh, anyway, let, let oh, me let thank Mark you. expand on that. Thank you. Gets up there. Next. So there you go. Thank you. 15, Representative McCall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'd just love to say thank you all for working with, with Athens Tech and, and getting uh, that training facility over in Elberton. If we could get Gypstick out of the way <laughs> to quit drawing designs and requiring everything that's useless, we'd have a thing built by now. But uh, You could just build it and let them draw the design when you get through. I, yeah, I didn't know it was as bad as it is. <laughs> until you get to fooling with it. But thank you all for that. And, and to answer Don's question, I think we can do, just do away with opening day of dove season and make all our lives easier. <laughs> yeah. <wouldn't> make <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> um, thank you for those comments, Chairman Cole. We, we were real excited to help with that curriculum, and that was a great partnership. Okay, anybody else? That's a great discussion. Okay, Commissioner, I'll let you – Next up, uh, our division director, Rusty, um, has busted up. We had a knee replacement, so we have deputy director Mark Whitney coming in. There you go, Mark. Morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, we'll get to your question in just a second about doves. Happy to, happy to address that. Uh, but it's a pleasure to be here in front of you all today to talk about wildlife resources. <laughs> It happens to be my passion, so I'm lucky enough to work in something that I feel very, very strongly about and have loved my entire life, so I'm tickled to be here. Um, there we go. That's what I'm looking for. So uh, in Wildlife Resources, just a, just a real quick uh, introduction, we're, we're the professional technical and scientific arm of DNR for all mammals, all birds, and all uh, reptiles and amphibians, and you can throw in marine mammals like whales and dolphins, and you can throw in loggerhead sea turtles too. So that's kind of what we deal with, and we do it essentially by collecting a lot of information, crunching a lot of numbers, and applying scientifically proven habitat management techniques uh, in order to both recover species as well as manage, manage uh, sustainable wildlife populations for an enjoyment of, uh, of everybody. So that's kind of where we stand and what we attempt to do in most years. And also in a little bit of way of, of orientation, we do that through a pretty simplified um, uh, org structure. Out of the director's office, we do a tremendous amount of communications and our public affairs staff, there's outreach communications. Uh, they also do some specialty work just like Y'all will excuse me for just half a second. I have to attend to my insulin pump here real quickly. Thank you. I appreciate that. 
All right, so uh, our public affairs staff does all of our outreach and communications uh, statewide, as well as regionally uh, when we're uh, uh, communicating and working with other states. Um, and then our license and boat registration unit uh, handles exactly what that says. Sells all of our licenses, registers all of our boats, and uh, is one of the primary places where we get calls and interact with the public for wildlife resources division. We're bringing in roughly uh, $32 million a year in all revenues, and, uh, and we are licensing a little, about 650,000 hunters, about 1.2 million anglers, uh, and a little over 300,000 boats, I believe, right now. And then we have our three uh, field operations sections, wildlife conservation section. They're responsible for 95% of species, the ones you don't hunt and fish. Uh, and they also do uh, plant communities, uh, especially in the rare, threatened, endangered, and special concern arena. Um, our fisheries management section, obviously, uh, are our fishery staff, and they operate our hatcheries and our public fishing areas, and our game management staff for those animals that are uh, hunted and trapped, uh, as well as manage our 107 wildlife management areas. And I'll call to your attention, and I also want to thank uh, the, the colonel uh, for the work that his staff does in protecting our, our public spaces. Uh, that's great news, and we have a good relationship with them. But I've got somewhat bad news for the colonel in that we now have 107 WMA, so their workload's going up a little bit, and certainly hope y'all get support to, to handle that. So um, anyway, you can, you can look at the map. You probably recognize your area of the state. We have facilities across the state, whether that's a wildlife management area, 107 of those, 10 public fishing areas, 10 hatcheries. Uh, and natural areas as well. And this is where we're doing the work. We have a tremendous amount of shooting ranges. We've got uh, close to a million recreational shooters in the state. And, uh, and we currently have five manned shooting ranges and we're, we're, we're moving up on that. 21 archery ranges. Um, I think Hunger Games really boosted the, uh, the archery uh, interests. And so we're, we're dealing with some increased demand there. And I think we're responding very well. Like the law enforcement division, we too uh, are undergoing a little bit of a reorganization. Uh, it's a little bit different for us because one of our sections, our game management section, is going from seven to six regions like law enforcement, but our fisheries section is going from five regions to six. And as we were going through a lot of different potential iterations of how this might look and how it might work most efficiently, uh, Colonel Bernard had his 2 a.m. brainstorm and came up with this map and, in fact, overlaying it, it works very well for us. It increases our communications with law enforcement and within our, law enforcement and within our own division, so it, it, it's working well. The other thing we're doing in terms of trying to improve efficiencies is we are going to a two assistant chief uh, organizational structure in our headquarters office which is reducing our administrative staff at headquarters and we're pushing those down to the field in order to be able to continue to deliver good customer service to our hunters and anglers and our wildlife watchers out there too. Um, this is work in progress. We hope to have everything completely done by July 1st. We're already operationally working this way. But uh, as our administrative services folks downtown can tell you, there's a lot of stuff in the background that has to happen related to budgets and, and uh, supervisory responsibilities that we're continuing to work on to get us there. I'm really proud of this slide, and I want to point out to y'all, y'all have been very gracious to uh, Wildlife Resources Division as well as DNR as a whole related to House Bill 208 a couple of years ago to help us increase uh, license fees. Um, we are currently receiving about 22 million uh, state dollars out of our license revenue, which is great. But I would call attention to one of these slides anyway. We're actually expensing about $73 million a year. And I bring that to your attention so that you understand what good stewards we are being of those state dollars you've entrusted us with. We are constantly searching for federal dollars and private partner dollars and able to pull those in in order to expense on species of concern as well as management of our uh, wildlife management areas, building new shooting preserves. Love to sit down with y'all for about two days and run you through how our budget works, but, but suffice it to say, if we're being appropriated about 22 million 
state dollars and we're expensing 73 million and we're not going in the red every year we're doing a really good job of pulling in other dollars and leveraging those to the benefit of uh of georgia citizens this is really something that we're extremely proud of and for those of y'all who may or may not know just a real quick iteration of a lot of the federal dollars that come to us are what's in called the wildlife and sport fish restoration program it's managed by the u.s fish and wildlife service and what allows us to capture those dollars and capture them at a high level is being able to certify license sales we have to sell a license in order to be able to capture those federal dollars the more of those folks we can sell them to, the more of those dollars we capture. This money comes from an excise tax on ammunition as well as sporting firearms and some other equipment like archery equipment, and it's there for the taking. We just have to be able to sell licenses and count people appropriately according to their rules. Right now, we're expending about $32 million annually in federal dollars under this program, or we're at least getting those or within our budget for our use. We write grants on those and, and that's how we bring them back into the state in order to expend them. And with that, I will, uh, I will end the uh, presentation. Mr. Chairman, if I may address the, the, the Dove question, I, I will. It's a great question and as you might imagine, we get it a lot. Um, so the commissioner is absolutely right. Uh, there are uh, sideboards put on us by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on all migratory hunted species, including doves. That's doves, that's ducks, that's geese. Um, so, so we do have some sideboards within which we have to work. Some of y'all have, have been here long enough. I've been working with you long enough. You remember when we used to have zones for doves. Uh, I don't know if you ever were in one of those counties where they became controversial, but every time you draw a line, we have found that, that you, you essentially create the haves and the have-nots. And, and what occurred through the years, and I spent a lot of time down here um, trying to figure out a way to best manage those lines, will give us this in this county as soon as you do, then, then you've created another have and have-not. That got to be such a burden to the members of the General Assembly that they asked us to find a way to do away with the Dove Zone line. And we eventually were able to do that under Fish and Wildlife Service <coughs> guidelines. And, and so we did. Now in addition to that, because this question comes up all the time, we, we have the ability to provide three different seasons, essentially, three different splits within our 90-day season. And we do that based upon the wishes of our hunters. Every time this question has come up, we have reached out to the public, our hunters, and said, what satisfies y'all the most? You never get the same answer from everybody, so, so we always end up with, with some who are less happy than, than others with our decisions. But there's a tremendous amount of dove hunters out there who are, uh, and we sell, heritage and tradition within the hunting community, but are married to that uh, first Saturday after Labor Day opening of dove season. There are, uh, there are actually economic development issues around that for us uh, when it comes to dove hunts and, uh, and farmers who lease their fields and other things associated with that. Where we've had the most ability to manipulate has been that middle season in October. And we have shifted that back and forth, trying to chase the peanut harvest in South Georgia, because that's when the doves really start to flood in there, uh, into those fields. And so we have, again, uh, asked the public, you know, what's the best way to do this? And, and, and we have uh, arranged those around satisfying the greatest number of, of people we can. With that, it's not the best answer for those who don't like to sit out there in 79 or even 89 degrees. Uh, so we actually went and looked at all the historical records uh, that, are, that are out there, uh, meteorological rec records for temperatures of opening day of dove season. And you know what? There's no significant difference in the temperature. So I hope not to offend anybody here, but I'm gonna tell you it affects me as well. And the older I get, the more it affects me. And, and, and so I, I sit out there on opening day during dove season 
with my radio on listening to the Bulldogs play going, good gosh almighty, why, why can't we change not some much of this stuff? In but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, we, we recognize that this is something we will continue to try to work on this to the best of our ability, but it is a controversial topic and we have landed in the best place that we know of today. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, Representative Dickey. Thank you. Uh, I was very impressed with that answer. Uh, very, very good. I'm, uh, those zones were definitely a problem, and I'm glad they're gone. Um, so, um, but yes, I, I do get everyone. I got a question um, about uh, boat registration. Uh, are, are, don't we do multi year registrations? Uh, yes, sir, we do. We do three year registrations. Do you know any reason Department of Revenue can't do three-year registrations on our cars and <laughs> trucks? Have you ever had a conversation with them? So, so currently we're in conversations with the uh, Department of Revenue related to uh, titling legislation that was passed, and, and we've had multiple conversations with them. We're trying our best to streamline everything to make it as simple as possible. Right now we're working with a licensed vendor in order to make the registration part as simple as possible. But uh, during those conversations, we'll certainly bring this up again and see what kind of response we get. Well, I appreciate the multi-year. Uh, I wish uh, I didn't have to go to my local tag office every year and get that little sticker for my car. Great, 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 great. But um, anyway, thank you for what you do. I'm very impressed. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank Mark, you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Doug is up at a fisheries meeting in uh, Northeast, and so Carl, his deputy, is going to be giving the CRD report. I won't steal all the cars, calls thunder, but uh, it was not real normal year down on the coast. We had a couple of things happen that never happened or hadn't happened in a long time, and that's uh, we had some pilot whale strandings that I'm sure you made a lot of national news on our beaches, and then had a ship turnover in our harbor uh, between Jekyll and St. Simons, and he's got a little briefing on that. So I'll turn it over to Carl. Thank you, Commissioner, and thank you, Chair, for having me today. Um, Doug wanted me to say, apologize for him not being here in person. He's up in Virginia at a fisheries meeting looking out for our coastal interests down here in Georgia. So um, as the Commissioner mentioned, it has been kind of a busy year, and I do, want to appreci I do appreciate and thank you guys for coming down and spending some time with us in the fall with your um, Policy Academy. Um, so briefly, just to look at the um, latest, greatest update dealing with the cargo ship, uh, matter. This is a brief little video that was put together by TNT, the salvage company that is currently uh, working the removal plan. Um, the unified command made up of the Gallagher Marine, the U.S. Coast Guard, and of course the state continue to work this issue. But this video here shows you where they stand now with the removal plan itself um, that was just um, approved this week by the Corps of Engineers and the state. So here you'll see what they're doing is bringing in this large crane that will um, be a floating crane. It'll have a diamond cutting uh, chain that will cut the ship into eight sections. So these seven cuts to make these sections uh, will take about 24 hours for each cut. Um, right now we are on the verge of beginning the construction of the environmental protection barrier in the next two weeks. Um, that barrier will help um, um, contain any surface debris and it will also include a double layer netting that will um, hopefully contain all the subsurface uh, debris. In addition, crews will be working on the inside and the outside of that um, barrier to ensure that we do as much as we can to uh, protect the environment. Um, like I mentioned, the, the removal plan has just gotten approved this week by the state and federal authorities and the Unified Command will be hosting a um, a meeting on the 7th of February at 10 o'clock and they actually will be taking place at our office down in Brunswick uh, for the public to come in and learn more about this. In relationship to that, the cutting schedule, like I mentioned, it's going to take about 24 hours for each of those cuts. Um, as soon as that schedule is set, that schedule will be published so the public will be aware of that. Um, also, I'd like to mention that if you'd like to continue to have updates on this, there's a web page that um, keeps these um, constantly updated, and that's ssiresponse.com. Um, there you can find a lot of information as it's available um, in the different stages of this removal plan. 
The, um, as it stands right now, the removal plan, um, here's some still images here that showed that we just saw in that video. This removal plan, if all goes well, they're saying will take about 60 days. So um, obviously there's a lot of variables that could extend that. Um, the hopes is that we get this thing taken care of and removed prior to hurricane season. Not that we're going to have a hurricane this year because I think we've, we're good on that, but that is definitely the plan. Uh, once this, um, these sections are removed, they'll be placed on a barge and they will be uh, transported um, to an area that can, can receive those and, and will recycle as much of the material as possible. Uh, I believe last I heard that they were talking about barging these over to Louisiana. So, it, it can, looks. Can, can I ask a question? That, that's a oh, substantial okay. barrier there. Those, those little pylons you see there are 48 inches in diameter. And will go between, I'm told, between 100 and 150 feet into the drill, pounded into the ocean floor. Very good point. It, this, the, the picture does not give it justice in terms of scale. I think some of you have had the opportunity to see this down on the coast. Um, the, one of the biggest challenges with this is obviously to continue the um, keeping up with the health and safety component of this. That's always been priority one. The second priority, of course, being the environmental um, impacts. And the third is timing, trying to get this taken care of as quick as possible while not affecting the navigation channel. So the plan that was um, approved by the state and the federal obviously was very geared to those 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 components so so you say it's going to be like a chain that's going to cut that what about the have we got the right i, I guess you do the right protection in place because there's going to be a certain amount of shavings that are going to come off on each one of those cuts and it could be a tremendous amount you know on yep. each one so yep, yep, yep. The, the the net that as i say net it's a it's a substantial it's not you know, like a fishing net, but right. the barrier, uh, one, the, the inside layer's got a five foot mesh on it is the current Correct. plan, but then there's an outside layer that they drop, they can raise and lower. They don't want it down all the time because they want fish and stuff to be able to come in and out. So when they're cutting, they're going to, they're, they're able to lower that smaller mesh that will trap all the little particles. Oh, okay. All right. And in addition to the mesh, that will be your subsurface, your above, above surface will have the boom system that will capture a lot of those floating pieces. And, and as I mentioned, they will be having crews on the inside and side, outside of the barrier, continuing using booms to try to capture any pollutants that would be on the surface. And once cut into those sections, where are they going to transport those to? Someplace pretty close by? The, the last I'd heard is that they're looking at sending that to Louisiana, and the reason for that is because there's got a facility that can receive that large of sections. Um, that, that's, the, that's where it is. That's the, the uh, plan that the current contractor has, TNT. Hmm. Okay. Any, okay. Excuse me. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No. <laughs> No worries. All right, so briefly, um, on our day job, part of the gig here down at Coastal Resources, we uh, manage quite a, um, a vast area down the coast, as many of you know. When we talk about the coastal area, we're talking about those six ocean-facing counties, but also the five interiors, so 11 counties total, which comprise of over 300 um, square miles of Atlantic Ocean, 105 miles of beach, and, of course, 14 barrier islands up and down the coast. We do this um, um, with main, mainly two sections. We have our, our marine fishery section and our coastal management section. Um, a lot of our administrative, HR, and of course our outreach and education stuff is in our director's office. But I did want to briefly kind of hit some of the points of these um, different sections. So first off, that coastal management section um, is where we house our coastal and ocean management program. They're responsible for coastal hazards planning, wetlands monitoring and assessment, and our coastal incentive grants program. Uh, we also have our marsh and shore management program. This is our regulatory side of it. As you guys know from last year, um, the Shore Protection Act, also the Coastal Martian Protection Act, and the state's revocable license for the management of tidally influenced waters on the, on the coast are managed through this program and administered those state laws. Um, of course, you can't have a regulatory group without some sort of compliance enforcement, and so we do have a compliance component within the coastal management. They investigate violations of the marsh and the shore laws, and they do inspect our permits and ensure compliance with those permits. Um, another component of the coastal management is our shellfish program and water quality. Um, similar to other shellfish producing states, Georgia uses the requirements and the guidelines 
as prescribed in the National Shellfish Sanitation Program to ensure that the shellfish is harvested and sold for commercial is safe for all consumers. Um, when you shift over to our marine fishery side, we have um, our fishery statistics. They're in, um, empowered to deal with the seafood harvest statistics, our saltwater angler surveys, and our saltwater fishing guide surveys. We have our research and surveys, which does a lot of independent fishery management through our ecological monitoring and surveys. This is the uh, um, research vessel Anum that many of you are aware of. We also have our Marine Sport Fish Population Health Survey, which was um, up until just a couple years ago, mainly focused in the Walsall Sound and Altamaha. With the uh, license revenue enhancement money that we're receiving on the coast, we're able to add a third um, um, sound now down in St. Um, um, so then we've got the adult red drum and shark long line. This is another independent survey that though it's targeting red drum, it catches a lot of sharks, but it still gives us a lot of data associated with the development of those species. And then we have our sport fish carcass recovery project that um, is a partnership that we work with uh, with um, citizen uh, to try to donate their carcasses once they fillet the fish. And we're able to take that fish, those carcasses, and be able to uh, work them up and get sizing and, and um, sex um, information. Uh, we have our boating and fishing access on the coast. Currently, we have about 42 boat ramps and 41 fishing piers. And then last but not least is our habitat enhancement. This is where we have our artificial reef, both inshore and offshore uh, creation. And then, of course, our oyster restoration um, projects that we do up and down the coast for fish habitat. Another program that's benefited from the license revenue money received. And so that was pretty brief, so I'd be more than willing to take any questions, sir. I will say, Mr. <laughs> we, 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 um, I get a lot of questions about can we use that boat for artificial reef. Well, you can't just put it out there unless it's been, but uh, the company was uh, kind enough to let us have the propeller and rudder. Yes, uh, and that propeller, I believe, was 60 feet across. So it, wow. helped, it really made nice reef because it goes – all the directions so How about we, that? we've already deployed that hey i gotta say thank you too because uh chair lady smith always sets up the tour and this fall we went down we spent what three days of three and a half days mm -hmm. and it was non-stop from seven in the morning and on and off the bus but y'all y'all put on some programs and some demonstrations for us some of those p pictures are very familiar you know how, how you dissect the fish and you're studying the wildlife all the time i think one of the key ones that was too was the increase in the turtle sea turtle population the number of nests i mean it was this minuscule there one year and now it's kind of off the chart so that's all due to record years yeah all due to a good management okay i'm gonna start on this end this time uh mayor france i'm excuse me representative <laughs> Oops. Um, I have some question about your budget cuts in FY uh, 20 and 21. So um, in 20, um, there's a cut of a little over 108,000 for regular operating expenses, and then that cut, and then there's um, that cut is um, repeated in 21 mm -hmm. plus. Um, you're losing 173,000 plus for some positions that you're replacing with state, let's say you're replacing state funds with federal funds. So curious to know what you're actually losing with your operating funds. And then also just one quick question. When you, I know in some agencies, when you replace um, state funds with federal funds, you lose a match. I don't know if y'all have any matching funds in that and you're losing any so so just would like some more detail definitely definitely excellent question so um very similar to uh, uh, assistant director whitley was mentioning with wrd we take state funds and then we actually are able to use that to leverage a lot of federal funding to make uh, our budget work for us so our overall budget is 8.6 million and as you can see by the graphic on the screen only 34 percent of that is state so those state cuts that you're referring to, uh, we were able to absorb those um, cuts by putting more 
of our operational costs towards the federal side of that and being able to leverage more federal money and reallocate some of that federal money to that. I mentioned that we have our coastal incentive grant program, which is money that we pass through mm -hmm. um, through our coastal zone management program. That's another source that we're able to not only be able to absorb some of that, but also that's where we're able to make up a lot of that match concern that you referred to. So you are losing match. We are losing match, but we're able to redo that, uh, able to leverage some of that match through other ways by making sure that we can match uh, those third party groups that are coming in and applying for coastal incentive grants. We're also looking at opportunities to match some of the uh, licensed revenue money that was an enhancement from two years ago that we're continuing to get also. So we're just reevaluating that. In regards to the, to the position cuts, um, we um, have had a couple of individuals of recent that retired. Um, and so as they've retired and their replacements coming in, we're, we're reshuffling the deck of the org chart, if you will, to, to sure. ensure that that is more efficient and we're able to um, make savings there. I just remember from our visit that it seems like y'all had a pretty tight ship already and there were, you, you were kind of, you di didn't seem like you had a lot of positions that you could um, manage without. That, that is true. We, we have a very tight state budget, and so we, we're, we have to be very mindful of every time that that is affected, that how that um, domino falls on the federal side of our funding also. So, you're, yeah, so I really don't feel like I got an answer. You're just absorbing things, and I, yeah, so, I mean, $108,000, I guess I'm not, sh I'm not sure about the impact, but maybe we can talk later. I, I think one good question, that would be a great question for the subcommittee on appropriations too. Yes, sir. I mean, that'd be a great question for that and get into that detail. We'll probably get those schedules out pretty quick. Um, hopefully today we'll have those schedules. So good question. Okay. Ms. Angela. Thank you. And I want to say uh, uh, thank you very much. The, the experience we had, all of us can say, on the, uh, on the coast in, in, was it September, October? Mm -hmm. It was one of the best trips I've ever done. <laughs> so it, it, Because it, it was really like uh, 7 in the morning to 7 at night. But what we learned during the time really gives me a lot of appreciation of what you guys are doing and trying to do. And uh, so, so also shows us that I think we are investing our state dollars very well. So, <laughs> so but I have one question uh, regarding that <coughs> to uh, the shrimp population because remember when we visited your coastal station in down in Brunswick, we talked to some folks where, and the rising temperature is an issue for the shrimp population. And my question is, uh, do you make any projections how that could affect? your budget in the future because you may lose something, you may have to invest more. So are they, uh, 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 can you make any <clears throat> assumptions about what happens in the future and how, it will, how it's going to affect you? Um. I think that the, the answer there I would have to say with is that we're constantly monitoring that. We do have federal funds that help do that monitoring program, so the state cuts do not affect our ability to continue to monitor that, that portion of our uh, shop, if you will. Um, there are a lot of variables that are in play there, uh, um, when it comes to the shrimp population. Um, a couple years ago, we had the hard freeze that, that affected it. Um, the thing that seems to be affecting the, sh um, the shrimping industry on the coast is not so much the, that, but the actual fleet themselves. There's, there's a declining fleet of uh, fishermen doing this type of work on the coast, and they're having a hard time to compete with importing shrimp, of course. Um, but from a prediction, it, it, excuse me? <laughs> hey, they're my favorite. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they're the best. <laughs> mm -hmm. so thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like a little update on our uh, oyster bill. Excellent. So, um, as many of you know, there was a change in the, the law last year that allowed not just the historical um, wild harvest of oysters, but to move into a mariculture process. Um, that, that bill that was passed and came into law um, had a lot of uh, regulations that needed to be adopted by the Board uh, of Natural Resources. And the majority of those, the big package of rules, were um, just recently passed in December. Um, so those are looking good. 
Um, we do have a couple of minor things that we're still working on in terms of the criteria for siting that we're working with our um, citizen panel, our uh, advisory panel of folks that were put together to help us with this. Uh, we're also continuing to work with the Corps of Engineers who have a regulatory dual, dual jurisdiction to try to find ways to um, efficiently go through their regulatory process for this. Um, the deadline, if you recall, for that uh, enacting of that law and the activity associated with those rules was uh, March of this um, uh, 2020. We seem to be on track with that. We're in hopes to getting um, probably three leases out um, in the lottery system, um, which we're again working with our citizen um, panel to ensure that we've got great um, in information coming in and buy into the process. Okay. Uh Representative Dickey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, um, Chairman Hogan um, asked mainly one of my questions I was going to ask, so I'm glad to see that oyster thing is moving along. Um, about, the, about the ship that flipped, uh, I didn't think ships could do that. I mean, I know it was a huge financial loss to whoever owned that ship, but what it occurred to me that that could have happened. It happened in a pretty good spot. It didn't affect traffic but that if we ever had one to flip in the savannah river in the port it'd be bad trouble is it any i mean is that just a once in a million uh occurrence boat doing that is it is it something we need to worry about that, that would happen and when ships go in and coming for savannah port I think it's we our are first. <laughs> we, it's our first, definitely, and I hope it's our last. <laughs> but um, I think that, um, that it's for as many ships that are coming in and out of the ports world around, we're, uh, within the, the entire world, this has occurred a handful of times. It's not that it doesn't happen, but it's very infrequent. Um, I think that you bring up a very good point. The, the location, where it was done, the actions that were associated with the bar pilot that was working it, there was a lot of variables that if it were to happen, where it happened and how it happened was probably the best case yeah. scenario we could ask for. It was able to uh, beach that, that ship um, in an area that was shallower waters that probably saved lives. It made the environmental containment a lot easier to deal with. And then, of course, it was out of the channel, which did not block uh, other than the initial first few days for, for um, safety purposes and did not block the port itself. Thank you. All right. Representative Hogan. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, pilot uh, Tom Tennant uh, was a person that uh, was able to pull that off when that ship started listing real bad. He knew it was going to be turning on its side, so he maneuvered that ship to the shallow part of the channel, which saved the lives of those individual crewmen on board. And uh, you can thank Tom Tennant, and he is a neighbor of mine on St. Simon, so he did a great job. Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. How long did you say he had to react when he first realized? That, was it very little time? I don't know what uh, what time, what time it was, but that ship was listing, and I don't know what caused it to start listing. It was a ballast that was not properly done, or something with the ballast. So he was able to maneuver that ship to the shallow part of that channel. Thank you, Representative. Any other questions? Commissioner, we're going to turn it over to you. Thank you, All right. Carl, for your you, presentation. Carl. Huh? Well, Mr. Chairman, um, that concludes my report. My feet are almost dry. <laughs> <laughs> we can keep you a little longer if we need to. But I did, I did want to say to Representative Th Thomas, if you've got any eligibility left, we'll take you back at DNR. <laughs> <laughs> and that concludes my report. Uh, we heard that. You've got a witness, Representative Thomas. No, we really, I tell you, this this has been great info, um, and appreciate the chair lady, Ms. Smith, setting this up for y'all to come, and thank y'all for what you do for the state of Georgia. We really appreciate it. If there are no other questions, we're adjourned. Thank you.